What's going on, everybody? Welcome to the another edition of Men in Stripes, brought to you by StripePipe.com, a fan site exclusive. We're going a little early this week due to the Thanksgiving holiday. Wanted to make sure we got a show in for the week, and especially after the season takes another twisted, terrible turn for the Cincinnati Bengals. So, Tim Daniel here, as always, to talk about the three six and one Cincinnati Bengals with Shelby Dermer and Matt Wilson, gentlemen. What's up? Oh, you know, couldn't be happier to talk about a football team that is. 3-6-1 and one, that had a chance to really make some noise today with Baltimore losing to the Dallas Cowboys. And, oh, what a shock they couldn't. Um, their best player is now out for looks like the season with a hand, with his hand, with a torn hamstring. So that's awesome. Um, their offensive line, you know, had a decent day. Their defensive line had a decent day. But, well, you know, and Tyler Boyd had a good day. But other than that, I can't tell you anyone else had a good day. Um, well, besides Vontaze Perfect. He's been on a roll the past couple weeks. Um, yeah. They let Tyrod Taylor ex- execute the game plan. Even after Shady McCoy gets uh, taken out of the game, they still can't they capitalize. They let Gillisley run for 60 yards. Reggie Bush was getting big plays. Mark, I mean, I, you know, Robert Woods got hurt in this game, and the Bills still were making things happen. Charles Clay didn't do much, and they still managed to win this game. Um, I will say, you know, obviously, how could I forget? Mike Nugent misses two extra points, so there could have just been a field goal kick at the end of the game with a fair chance to win, but, you know, whatever. So, Matt, I'll get started with you since you wrote the article today about basically um, giving your true feelings on Mike Nugent, which is shocking for an Ohio State fan to actually admit that one of their guys isn't good. So, 3-6-1, and one, I think it's safe to say without A.J. Green that they are finito, they are finished, we should start talking about top 10 draft picks next year. Yeah, that's the, uh, the thought process for sure, and that's something that uh, I'm, I'm pretty... Uh, I don't want to say adamant on again, but it, it's oh, writing's on the wall. Um, you know, it, it sucks that uh, it looks like uh, it, sh- it could be a torn hamstring. Uh, hamstring, obviously, we won't know until the MRI tomorrow, um, or at least after the MRI tomorrow. Let's put it that way. Uh, on what it really is, if it truly is a torn hamstring, but that's the early diagnosis. Um, you know, Jeff Hobson from, of course, Bengals.com wasn't very optimistic uh, on everything with A.J. Green, and so that puts a damper on things as well. Um, another person who had a decent day today was actually Giovanni Bernard. I mean, I think he well, he was second in receiving behind Tyler Boyd. Um, didn't do too much in the run game, but uh, he, played a, he played a vital part in continuing that drive uh, late that um, a field goal really should have been the, what, what won the game. Um, where he picked up a 13 yards on a third and 12. So, um, you know, again, the offense wasn't what we we had hoped it would be. Uh, obviously, AJ Green going down didn't help the situation, but you can't just have one playmaker on a team that's not going to make a, a playoff or a Super Bowl caliber team. If he's the only person that's able to make a play on a team, then they really need to uh, reanalyze the talent that they have. Well, Shelby and I, I know, tweeted both both tweeted this during the game. When AJ goes down, where you know we're like, oh, you know, that stinks. That's not good, obviously. Um, Tyler forgets what five targets today. That's it. Yeah, something like that. Like your second best player on offense gets five targets after your best player goes down. Like I don't, I don't think that's like that's that's not good game planning there, Shelby. That's that's not good game planning at all. Yeah, I for uh, six targets, uh, three catches for thirty-seven yards. And you know, one of the uh, the catches he had was right there on the last drive, setting up the hail mary. So you can't really put that in. But we also got to remember, once Dalton did start targeting him, targeting him, he got hurt over there on the sidelines, like he always does. Uh, took a hard hit from a safety. And Dalton put it in there uh, up the sideline, made the catch. But yeah, it's a, it 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 seems obvious. You know, when Green goes out, uh, you're gonna want to go with Eifert, he's your Pro Bowl tight end, but, you know, I think the Bills had a good job with, with not worrying about Green. Rex Ryan used a, a shadow defense on Tyler Eifert. A lot of the time had someone underneath him over the top as well, so I think that's why you saw such an emergence in Tyler Boyd's targets as well as Brandon LaFell. And by the way, I mean, if we can say one good thing about this game, obviously, like, that throw that Dalton had to Boyd in the end zone was freaking gorgeous. Beautiful throw. Yeah, it, it, it looked it was it was the exact same play he hit AJ Green on in the winter in Baltimore last year if you remember that. Yeah. In That's... the in the corner uh, with the underneath guy to the left running a slant uh, 
over top of the safety. Yeah, perfect throw. And it, and it was good to finally see Boyd get in the end zone because we've seen last week against the Giants, close call, pretty much made the difference, and then uh, dropped a touchdown against Miami. And then, of course, had his homecoming in Pittsburgh spoiled by that controversial fumble too. So I, I was really happy for him. Yeah, I was too. I think that was huge there. So um, on the defensive side, you know, Draker Patrick makes another great interception. Um, God, the level he's played at this year has been awesome. Um, I know he's had some penalties. I know he's given up some plays like every corner does, but he has been very reliable. Um, Dark West Denard, truthfully, minus a play here and there, was very reliable when he has a chance to come in the game. And I thought, you know, I was happy with how he played to have filling in for Dre. Um, Sean Williams going down obviously hurt, but Darren Smith also stepped up. So as far as the young guys go, there was definitely some optimism. Um, but, you know, overall... It just felt like it just wasn't enough to take on it, you know, to take on. We can't even call them a good Buffalo Bills team. They're not a good team. Like, the yeah. Bengals let that one slip. Well, not only did they let that one slip, I don't really think you can put this too much on the defense. I think there was plays that they missed. Sure. Um, you know, their their run game uh, shouldn't have been as good as it was, but uh, what is it, Galisi, uh, I think his name is? Yep. Um, I mean, 14 not to carries. Not the Game of Thrones character, Khaleesi. Uh, thanks for that clarification. Uh, <laughs> 14 carries, 72 yards. Um, obviously, something that, that shouldn't have happened. Uh, I mean, Tyrod Taylor was only held to 166 passing yards, uh, a pick, and he had no touchdown passes. So um, this defense did its job. It did what it was supposed to do, and that's keep this team in it. The offense did absolutely nothing to help. So, um, I, I, you know, I like what Vontez Perfect did. He had one sack. He had, I think, another QB hit. He had a tackle for a loss. He had, uh, I think, 13 total tackles. He, he, yeah. he, he played it. He was the best person on this defense as, as you opened up the show with him. And, uh, I mean, Adam Jones wasn't terrible, although that fumble on um, uh, – what was it on a – was it a punt that he fumbled? I, yeah, I but he, ended I didn't still get to see that. he got some yardage out of it still too, though. Yeah, I think he had like 13 yards on the return, if I remember correctly, on the stats. Um, so, I mean, it wasn't obviously terrible, but um, something that I think he probably could have gotten a few more yards if, if he wouldn't have fumbled the ball. Um, setting up, uh, setting them up a little bit better than than what they were. But uh, Dunlap and Johnson split a sack, which was nice to see. You know, the edge guys making some plays. Um, but overall, I, I really can't put this on the defense. The defense no. did its job. Yeah, they did. I mean, you knew that Lashawn McCoy was at some point going to get a touchdown. That's what he does. And yep. you know, and then, like before he got hurt, he looked good. And that was a crazy play that he got hurt on. It looks like they said he's done. Uh, that's not too serious. So the Buffalo fans will have him back for the Jaguars next week. So that's good to know. Uh, but, yeah, man, overall, just a really frustrating day. Um, they are what they are. They're 3-6-1. Yep. Uh, they're not catching up. You know, I feel for guys like Andy who are going to get a lot of crap. I know he didn't have a great game. He made some bad throws, but... You know, people are obviously going to want to blame it on him still because that's what happens when, he, when the Bengals play bad. It's all Andy Dalton's fault. But when they play well, it's Tyler Eifert and A.J. Green's fault, uh, abilities that have bailed him out, basically. So, But overall, Preach. yeah, like, <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm so tired of it. Like, And even today, like Chris Spielman just blew my mind. So there's that play when they're driving down there, and it's like a second and long when they're trying to drive. And A.J. throws for LaFell, and it's a little behind, sure. But, like, a very catchable play by Brandon Fell. Like, he could have definitely made that catch. And they're like, well, Andy Dalton threw it over there. And I'm like, shut up. And then there's the tip, the interception for the half, which, yeah, it's a bad Tim, throw. Tim, Tim, I'm sorry. I wanted to clarify. Was it the one to LaFell where it was incomplete? Yeah. Okay, okay. Just just making sure. Oh, no, the pick was the pick was definitely a bad throw, the one that was intended for yeah, LaFell. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, yeah. I, I was, I, I'm pretty sure I had it, and then I – just wanted to clarify. Go ahead. And then, um, yeah, the second pick. So, and you, you all know how much I love Eifert, but I, you know, and I don't think it's a great throw either. So don't get me wrong. I'm not putting this full blame on either one of the guys. But that was, you know, you could have easily knocked that ball down or you know made a little more effort than it could have been basically handing it to Gilmore to get his second pick of the game too. Right. Yeah. And you know. Let's play devil's advocate, and, you know, if, if Eifert catches that pass, 
are, are we confident with Nugent in a, in a 48, 47-yard field goal? No. Uh, so, so I think Eifert... Eifert's uh, left hand there might have uh, bailed Nugent out of a, a big a big miss and some more boo birds uh, from PBS. I was disappointed that there wasn't enough boo birds today. I had the TV muted. <laughs> they uh, <laughs> they booed here and there. Don't be wrong, but it wasn't like like the Monday night game last year when they were eight and zero. Were you there? I was there. Today? No, not today. I, I, oh. I watched that one from home. No, if I had gone, as soon as AJ got hurt, I would have gone home. No, you fucking wouldn't. <laughs> I, I would have been tempted. Oh, man. So, I guess it does bring us to the thing we got to discuss here, guys, before we go ahead and move forward. Um, Mike Nugent, again, a, a rough day, uh, to say the least. Two missed extra points. And it's not like it was, like, was kind of close. Like, no, both off the right pylon. Um, continue to be a frustration for this team. You know, I don't understand what's going on. Um, I don't know how we can't make kicks anymore. So, um, what, what, they can't, right? Like, if he's on the playing the ball for next week, that just shows that they gave up, right? That shows that, like, they just, they don't care about the rest of the year. I'll take this one, Matt. Um, <laughs> I know you wrote the article on it, but, yeah, I agree with you. I think I tweeted during the game after he missed the second one. I was like, he can't come back from this. Because, you know, the first one, you know, you give him a little leeway because... Clark Harris, uh, the snap was was really high, and I, a really good job by Kevin Huber, yeah, to even get it down, and, and Nugent clanked it. So I, I thought, okay, c- kind of a pass there, but the second one, perfect snap, perfect hold, laces out, no Ray Finkel with the Dolphins in that uh, pet detective movie. Ace Ventura, but yeah, Ace Ventura, you young people, you. <laughs> <laughs> and and uh. So, yeah, the, the second one was inexcusable, and, and, you know, luckily for him, well, maybe not luckily, uh, he didn't have any more field goal attempts for the rest of the day, so no chance to redeem himself and no chance to further get more blame on him for the loss. But, you know, the, the Bengals worked out a few kickers uh, after the Redskins fiasco, and, and I know Guy Forbath is one of them. He's been recently signed, Yeah, I saw. So, but... um. You know, they, they replaced Nugent in 2010 with uh, Clint Stitzer when they were out of the race, but that was, I believe that was because of an injury. It so was, I, yeah. I think, I, uh, but there's no reason he should be on the on the flight to Baltimore after this. And, you know, he's had a good run here. He, I think he's third on the Bengals all time scoring list behind Doug Pel- or behind Shane Graham and Jim Breach, two great kickers on the franchise history. Uh, just past Horace Bowman on the all time list, but, you know, as of today. You know, scoreboard wise, second time he's cost you a W. Yeah, man. And um, so yeah, like you said, Kai Forbes been signed. I believe Randy Bullock was another guy they worked out. I don't know if he's signed yet. Um, I don't think he has, if I remember correctly. I can hear Matt typing as we as we ask that. So uh, that's not what actually I was checking. And uh, there is another kicker that is available who a uh, change of scenery might help him. And he's been successful before, and that's Blair Walsh. Blair Walsh was cut by the Vikings. Oh my god, I forgot about that. But dude, so, he was worse than Nugent, like at points. Like since the there, playoffs, yeah, I mean, he's been worse than Nugent. But that may be too. I mean, give him a change of scenery where he gets that second chance. We've seen so many players, uh, especially for the Bengals, come out of stuff like that. I mean, Adam Jones, uh, Terrence Newman. Um, who who else am I am I blanking on that's that's we're come talking, from perfect. We're talking skill players though. We're not talking kickers here. Yeah. Where you have one job where your brain dictates about half the game and your leg dictates the other. Like yeah, like Blair Walsh. I mean, he's been a great kicker for a long time until you know this this weird stretch he's had. So I don't. Maybe it was a mental thing with that kick in the playoffs. Yeah, it yeah. very well could have been. That's what I'm saying. It can't get much worse, though, and if you pick him up and sign him for, you know, say say a, a year or two or whatever, and all of a sudden he turns the thing around, now you've got a great young kicker who's ha- or who is, uh, you know, eight years younger than the one you currently have, and you could sign him for, you know, a longer term and have a great kicker. What about the and, kid from Nebraska that worked at the dead camp this year? Zach Hawker. Yeah. Yeah. From Arkansas, wasn't it? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, he kicked with the Saints last year, uh, but he missed two 
potential game-winning field goals uh, with the Saints, but you know, I I wouldn't mind Blair Walsh, but I I wouldn't make it anything more than the end of the, this season, right? Like, you kind of earn your uh, earn a contract, a future contract if you're him, but you know, it, it can't get much worse now. I mean, we're just asking someone to make extra points, <laughs> right? <laughs> like that's all we're right, asking. I mean, I mean, dang. So now looking at the schedule before we talk about Baltimore real quick, both of you guys, like we like I've said, I think eight times already in the show, three six and one. What's the Bengals' final record at the end of the season? Matt, go ahead. Oh, uh, uh, you know, at this point, I, I'm I'm tempted just to say you know five ten and one at That's this point. That's what I have. Eight seven and one. <laughs> Without AJ Green, champs. <laughs> we have they a still optimist one, among they us. They are still one game back in the loss column. One yes. and a, oh yeah, they're a game and a half behind. In the loss column with three division games left. I'm just saying. <laughs> I love your optimism, buddy. I do. I but. hate it, but <laughs> <laughs> like, trust me, I've been there, man. I've been there. Like, they turn like, around and find a way to beat Baltimore, which I know we'll probably get to this because we we have to break down next week's game. But it's it's I I can't wait to hear what Shelby has to say after that if we, if they beat Baltimore. I would be happy you're right. I'll tell you that. So let's go to that, guys. <laughs> um, Baltimore loses today. They are for some reason somehow still probably going to make the playoffs because the AFC North is that good. Um, they have you know they get torched. Like, just about everyone has by Dak Prescott and Ezekiel Elliott because those guys are just incredible and amazing rookie talents that have been doing big things in Big D. And so Terrence West has had a good year for them. Um, Steve Smith, when he, you know, when he has played, has stepped up. They've gone through three or four tight ends. Their defense has been solid. Um, so I'm not saying Baltimore's a good team. I'm just saying between the three, they might be the best of the three, unfortunately. See, I, I'm going to disagree and say that looking at it right now, Pittsburgh has the upper hand to win the division because they still get to play Cleveland. Their schedule's a lot easier. Baltimore still has to uh, – I, I believe they go to New England. Or no, that, no, that's home against New England. But they still have to play the Patriots. Still have to play the Bengals twice. Uh, they don't get to play Cleveland anymore. And uh, and when they do play Pittsburgh again, that rematch will be at Heinz Field. So I think the upper hand would have to go to Pittsburgh. The only bi- the biggest question with Pittsburgh is if they can stay healthy on their defense because it's been subpar to say the least this yes. year. And if and if they can like beat the teams they're supposed to beat, even today in Cleveland, their offense scored one touchdown, and it was because of an untimed down on the last play of the first half. Yeah. Other than that, they had three Chris Boswell field goals, and uh, they had the fumble recovery for a touchdown. Correct. On on Josh McCown because Kessler left with a concussion. So yep. I mean, they didn't look that impressive against the, the worst team in the NFL. Well, record wise, I still think the Browns are better than the Forty ers I do too. But um, but you know, even against a terrible Cleveland team. That offense that lit up the Cowboys and was supposed to lead them to a Super Bowl this year only put up one touchdown, and it was on a play that shouldn't have happened. I agree. Yeah, and I mean, um, you know, schedule-wise, yes, you're right. Pittsburgh does have the up and up. Baltimore's got a game on them, so Baltimore's got the tiebreaker for now. I know they got to play again. Yeah, um, well, they're tied right now. Yeah. Yeah. But um, I really think that, you know... Focusing on the Bengals here and the Ravens matchup, uh, we mentioned last week the Bengals were currently riding a five-game win streak against the Ravens where, you know, normally those five games are A.J. AJ Green making the ridiculous play to give them the win, so we know that's not happening. Um, Right. Who steps up? Like, is this going to be the day that Tyler Eifert really just dominates again like he did in London? Like, is he going to go out there and make crazy plays again? Um can they count on their running game to show up for once against this good against this Baltimore defense? I don't think they can. Absolutely not. So, like, what happens this week? That I mean, that, and 
I was confident against Baltimore just because, you know, if you have A.J. Green, <clears throat> if, now with him out, if, if indeed the MRI comes back and says he's out for an extended period of time, one, like I told you before we started recording, Tim, it's a shame because he's only 34 yards away from a six straight thousand yard season. So that's just a crime. I believe he, he and Randy Moss would have been the only two to ever do it. Mm -hmm. uh, but now you take that away. And I think the biggest problem with Dalton today against the Bills is that it was kind of like 2014 where his receivers aren't getting open. Right. You know, man coverage was doing it for the Bills, and Dalton had to dump it down to Geo or throw into tight windows, and a lot of the times it was incomplete because he didn't want to force another interception and have his name drug through the mud again. But, and, and that's what it, we saw on offense, Ken Zampezi trying to run the ball on first and second down and Clint Bowling being beat like a drum on Kyle Williams. So nothing was there offensively, and, and the Ravens' defense is – in my opinion, better than Buffalo's. Yeah. And now you got to go on the road to M&T Bank Stadium. I, I, I like the way the defense has played the last two weeks for the Bengals. Yeah. So I think they can hold the Ravens to under 20 points. But the way the offense looked today, nothing points out, nothing gives you any uh, degree of optimism that, you know, the offense will be able to produce enough points to get a big road win. And in a, a loss to Baltimore, that would be – I mean, it, it – it's pretty much it's it's almost over right now, but a loss to Baltimore that would do it. I mean, three seven and one, you're not coming back from. No, I mean the the one big thing that I think we we have to look at right now is the aspect of who is most likely to step up, and I think we saw today. I mean, Tyler Boyd was the guy who essentially Andy Dalton kind of looked to. Um, and found open, and I think he made a couple great plays, um, especially for the position he was put in. And he, he, in all in all actuality, I, I think he's the guy that has to step up into that WR one role, even though you know Brandon LaFell's kind of been the WR two. Um, you know, obviously Eifert's there, uh, although you know that basically Baltimore is going to blanket Eifert to to make sure that yeah. you know they keep everything on the outside, but. We also then have, you know, Giovanni Bernard, a great checkdown option who made some plays, uh, as I said before today. Uh, and, and so for them, I think Boyd has to truly step up and be that number two that, you know, uh, Tim, you and I talked about at the beginning of the, uh, of the season where by the end of the season, I had a feeling that Boyd would really be the true number two and have to be that number two uh, for the, them to be successful. And he may be thrusted to be that number one receiver now. Every time you say number two, I always think of Austin Powers. <laughs> Who does number two work for? <laughs> and so, yeah, and I agree. So this is, uh, it's Boyd's time to shine, man, you know. It's a lost season. It's a situation where, you know, yeah, I mean, it's a chance to show what he can do. Um, you know, remember, b Fell's on a one-year deal. So, yeah, this is a situation where the Bengals can maybe count on Tyler Boyd to be WR2 next year. You don't have to go sign LaFell again. Not that LaFell's had a bad year by any stretch of the matter, but uh, you can go out there and you can draft a, you know, draft a wide receiver to put in that third spot. You can count on one of the guys you have currently, whether that be later, like James Wright looked good today in his in his snaps. Yeah. Um, whether that be, you know, you give Cody Core a chance to have that big, like, big red zone target that we discussed a few weeks back. Mm -hmm. um, what's his name? Antoine, Antoine Russell, I think, is on the practice squad right now, the kid from Canada. Um, yep. you know, that's a, he's a guy that has a lot of like is a raw talent and has some prospects to him. Or you go draft Mike Williams from Clemson with the whatever the hell pick you're going to have in the top ten. That's cool too. I'm down for that. I'll get to that. Obviously, <laughs> we have a long time to get before we get to that. But yeah, yeah. man. So I, I'm excited to see what Tyler Boyd brings. This is really his chance to show what he can do as far as being a yep. partial person. There, you think you can tell Andy's starting to get some trust with them. I know there's some plays that got away from Tyler today. You know, there's a throw there that should have been picked. Uh, when, Andy, when Andy was looking for him to get behind the nickel corner there, but yeah. I, I, I 100% agree, Matt. I think that this is uh, this is Boyd's chance, and this is you know the guy we've been reading about. And this was the guy you you were so excited they got in the second round, and I was with you. Yep. Um, yep. You know they did want to get Fuller though. Let's not forget that. Yeah. And and Tim, sorry, I kind of danced around your question thinking about it. Uh, the Baltimore game, you know, Eifert had four catches total in two games against Baltimore last season. Mm -hmm. uh, none in that game 
in Baltimore. No, no, no. Where he had the, he had a, where touchdown. He had the touchdown called back. Yeah. <laughs> uh, which which was uh, which was a which was a bad call, but the NFL catch rule uh, that should have been a touchdown. But he was held without a catch in that game, and and it's really going to be uh, Tyler Boyd or Brandon LaFell, one of the two. I know the Ravens. Jimmy Smith was out this week, didn't play, so we'll see what his status is. Uh, they do need to get Giovanni Bernard the ball more out of the backfield. Uh, you know, before that last drive, he wasn't doing anything out of the backfield, and, and the only reason he was open on that last drive is because the Bills knew the Bengals only needed a touchdown, so yeah, they were no giving up outs. anything. Yeah, no timeouts. They were giving up anything underneath and in the middle of the field, and it cost the Bengals a lot of time. So, uh, but uh, if they now with Green out. You saw in 2014 in the playoff game to the Colts, Rex Burkhead was in the slot a lot, uh, trying to fill in it of the receiver role. Kobe and Hamilton, you know, it, yeah, with Kobe Hamilton, who's now with the Steelers, getting playing, getting actual playing time, hilarious. Um, <laughs> but yeah, I, I feel like Burkhead or Bernard, one of the two, have to be uh, in the backfield and, and and use Tyler Croft more. Right. I mean, where, where's he been? And and you know I'm not I'm not big about Ryan Hewitt in the passing game, but as far as Tyler Croft, it, he's a big athletic guy out of Rutgers and makes plays too. When Eifert was hurt last year, and you know, I really need to see a lot more from him this season. Yeah, I agree, and so that's I think that's gonna be a big thing there. Um, that's a huge aspect for this game is you know like we keep saying, who steps up now? Who play, makes those plays? I don't trust anybody to make this plays yet as much as I like the prospects of Boyd. Uh, defensively, Matt, you know, this is a – you're going to game plan for Baltimore because you know – one, you know who's on the outside, and that's, you know, the ageless Steve Smith Sr. Well, I shouldn't say ageless because he's had some injuries catch up to him. But for some reason when he, hits the bank, when he plays the Bengals since he's been in Baltimore, even though they haven't won, he still makes crazy plays. Yeah. And like pushing off on players and getting offensive pass interferences? Well, that was in Cincinnati. Yes. And let's be honest, Aloka flopped there. Like, he NBA flopped on that one. <laughs> it worked. It was great. <laughs> I know, right? <laughs> but, like, total, like, watch, go back and watch it. Like, that's a total flop zone. That's okay, though. Yeah. Um, you know, I trust Draker Patrick. Uh, I think that, you know, he's going to be the guy. He's got to be the guy that pulls that matchup. And yep. I think he's going to be ready for that matchup. Um,. <laughs> I'm not 100% sure if I trust, you know, guys like Adam Jones and Dark West and Art going against Mike Wallace on the other end. So yeah. that's, that's going to be interesting. Yep. How does, how does Baltimore use Kent Dixon, if at all, in this game? You know, can Terrence West keep up this under-the-radar good season he's been having? And what Baltimore tight end are you game planning for? Can you get around Ronnie Stanley, Michael Johnson? There's a lot of questions about this Bengals defense going against this Baltimore offense. No, I, I think you're absolutely right. I, I mean, obviously Mike Wallace is there, um, you know, and so you see he still has some speed. I mean, and he had that huge play against the Steelers. So you definitely have to keep an eye on him. Um, you know, in, in terms of in terms of tight end, it's 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 hard to which one you have to game plan for because it seems like. You know, the one that you don't pick has a half-decent game. Um, obviously, it's still Joe Flacco. I mean, he's still average Joe. Uh, so that bodes well for the Bengals secondary if they do half of what they did against Tyrod Taylor uh, in, in terms of, of really playing well against the pass. I, I'd be extremely happy. I, I mean, um, let's face it, Joe Flacco is not the best quarterback to be back there. Uh, although he's he's done enough to win games in the past, and, and he did it against the Steelers, and um, he's he's done it against uh, other teams. I mean, he has what a Super Bowl, one Super Bowl, or is it two Super Bowl, one, one Super Bowl? Yeah, just one. Um, so uh, obviously he's done enough to win a Super Bowl, but at the same time, um, you know, you really got to look at. You, I mean, you had it right. I mean, how do you get around Ronnie Stanley, um, who is a, a a very good tackle? Um, but at the same time, I still think they have holes, and, and and if I think if you get what again what you got out of uh, this defense um, today, if you if you, they show up and play against this offense uh, the same way, I think you can get the pressure on Joe Flacco. I think you can disrupt 
Um, you know, the guys like Steve Smith Sr. and Mike Wallace. I think uh, Mike Wallace is a, would be a great matchup for uh, Dark West. Um, you know, both have some decent speed underneath them. And I, I would love to see that one-on-one matchup on the outside because I think Dark West and R matches up very well against Mike Wallace. Um, you know, with that being said, you still have to watch out for Pierman. Um, or Perryman. I, I forget how they pronounce it. Perryman, you're but, right. Uh, Okay, Perryman. Um, it, but there again, that's where Adam Jones comes into play. Uh, line him up against Perryman. Line line Dark West Denard up against Mike Wallace, and 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 take Drake or Patrick on Steve Smith Senior. And you've got a great matchup on every single one of them defensively. So I'm not too concerned with Baltimore's offense. My concern really is is this Bengals offense going to show up? Uh, because I think the defense could win this matchup for the Bengals. No, yeah, I, Matt. You, oh, sorry, Tim. No, I'll just say no. You're fine. Go ahead. <laughs> yeah, I, I was just gonna agree with that and say Matt made a good point. You know, if the Bengals pass rush, if Joe Flacco was quarterbacking the Bills today, the Bengals would have had four or five sacks. Yeah. Is Domita Pecco got in there, nearly had a sack on him. Carlos Dunlap missed him a few times. Tyra Taylor got very good shifty moves in the pocket and outside the pocket, and I think. You, you pressure Joe Flacco, you get sacks, and you get uh, terrible decisions, uh, which he still makes on a game-to-game basis. He'll, he'll throw you a few passes that can be picked off. And, you know, this pass rush will cure everything. And, and I really, it's just a shame, a, a great Bengals performance today on defense. Outside uh, the rush defense, And I, when I think Buffalo kind of got in their own way a little bit, uh, Tyrod Taylor missed a few throws that could have put the game away. Uh, late in this one, yeah. But you know, if if the Bengals can get any type of pressure on Joe Flacco, and he, he's not the most accurate guy throwing into tight windows, and, and that's no. why I really like the matchup. And Buffalo, they don't have a runner averaging more than four yards a carry. Terrence West at three point nine, uh, and actually that Kenneth Dixon got more work than West today. Uh, West though, he got the he broke the touchdown run early, gave Baltimore a seven nothing lead in Dallas. Uh, so his stat line looks a bit more attractive. But I, I really do like the defensive matchup. But then again, the biggest struggle is going to be this offense, yep. which in the past five quarters, going back to that fourth quarter against the Giants, has just looked abysmal. Yep. And I think, uh, so for me, biggest matchup as far as like one-on-one, as I know we mentioned on the cornerback wide receiver matchups and how big those are. For me, it's Marshall Yonda against Geno Atkins, like it is every time we have this game. It's the mm-hmm. best guard in the league going against the best defense attack in the league. I know. I like Aaron Donald, too. But I'm not. I, I don't think he's better than Gino. Well, he does. <laughs> he does things better than Gino. But I think as an overall player, I would take Gino. Um, so I think that's gonna be a huge thing in this game. Another one is you know Alex Erickson. For everything we've criticized him for, you know he's getting these big carries. I know he has some here and there where he doesn't break, but you know he's played well in these past few weeks, yep. and he's you know he's putting them in good position. If he can get those balls up to the 30, 31, 32 area, like. You know, that's going to be huge for this team, especially a team that really needs all the field position they can get. And that's something I probably would like to take a look at, too, because Erickson just isn't a return man. He also has the capability of being a a wide receiver. And placing him kind of in that James Wright type spot uh, as a number four, maybe moving right up to to number three, might be interesting because I think he has the hands to, to at least make a play or two. Yeah. I'm with you. All right, gents, let's go ahead and call this one as it is. I think I've made my opinions loud and clear. Uh, without A.J. Green, with Tyler Ruff getting blanketed, no ability to run the ball, um, you know, even though I think that uh, Baltimore is very limited, I still don't see – I mean, I'll say Baltimore wins this one 16-13 because I just don't think the Bengals will be able to make enough plays to win this one. That was my score prediction, but with the Bengals winning. Um, difficult one because I do think it's going to be incredibly close. Can, can, can I just say it just because he hasn't been cut yet? Um, and I really hope he does get cut. If he does, I'm, I'm extremely happy. But um, until he does, I'm saying that uh, Bengals lose on a last-minute field goal. I'm going 16-14. All right. So, guys, let's go ahead and knock out our Thanksgiving picks. And let's start on Thanksgiving itself. 12.30, the first one of the year. We know the Detroit Lions always get their beautiful Thanksgiving home game. And don't look now, but they're 6-4, playing against the 6-4 and four Minnesota Vikings for first place in the NFC North. 
Guys, I know the Vikings won today, but they really squeaked by. Carson Palmer had another pick six. I swear he has set the record for most pick six over 75 yards <laughs> in Vikings, right? He's got he's yeah. got to have that record. But yeah, I'm with you. Um, but the Lions and the Dome just they just they just do something different when they're in the Dome, and they're just so good there. So I think the Detroit Lions, yes, those Detroit Lions will be seven and four, and they will beat the Vikings on Thanksgiving. Go ahead, Matt. Uh, Golden Tate has a touchdown. Marvin Jones has a touchdown. Detroit wins big. Um, I'm going to go with the Vikings. Uh, not to be different, just because Detroit's 6-4, and 4-1 four, four and one at home. But did you guys see them play today against Jacksonville? I did not. Needed that 10 was points terrible. In the, needed 10 <laughs> points in the fourth quarter to win. Yep. They scored one offensive touchdown against Jacksonville's 25th-ranked defense. Yep. And, you know, Matt Stafford, the big MVP candidate from a few weeks ago, has been shockingly mediocre, or average, I'll say, not mediocre, because he didn't throw a pick today, which he's usually seldom of doing. Um, so I'm going to go with the Vikings, who, you know, they can finally take a breath and realize that, you know, the losing streak's done. They still have a great shot to win their division, and it starts with a win and a, and a redemption win from that loss in Minnesota. All right, so that's uh, Shelby going to be the, uh, the different one there. So let's go ahead and we go down to Dallas. We know the other team that gets a Thanksgiving game every year. Um, there's nothing like Thanksgiving where we watch Cowboys and Indians go against each other. <laughs> so we're going to get that this year. Um, the Cowboys at 9-1 and one host the Redskins at 5-3-1. and one. We'll continue to talk about is it racist or not. Um, <laughs> I will say that the Dallas Cowboys, Dak Prescott and Zeke Elliott, they, any chance that the t lights have been on them because they're the Dallas Cowboys, they have shined. They're going to shine again. I'll pick the Cowboys until they lose, man. They're going to be 10-1. and one. Hey, I'm going to say that it is racist. <laughs> and, oh, are Thank we you, picking Shelby. the game? <laughs> <laughs> oh, um, yeah, Dallas. You know why. All right, Matt? <laughs> Big Z, big Zeke, get okay. it done. At Lucas Oil Stadium, we have we have three dome Thanksgiving games this year. That's awesome. Lucas Oil Stadium, the five, the well, currently five and five Indianapolis Colts will host the five and five Pittsburgh Steelers. Um, I expect a shootout because I like you know obviously we know what the both quarterbacks can do. Um, Steelers have the edge, though, to have the fact that they have a running back they can count on and Le'Veon Bell in the backfield to catch passes and also make runs. Well, don't get me wrong, Frank Gore, for some reason, had a crazy receiving day today. But as much as I hate to say it, I like the Pittsburgh Steelers to win this one. But if, you know, if Andrew Luck and, the, and T.Y. Hilton and crew want to go out there and dominate the Steelers, then that'll, that'll make my Thanksgiving just fine and dandy. Yeah, same here, Tim. Exactly the same. I think it's going to be a shootout with two defenses that aren't very good. Um... You know, I, I want to pick the Colts because, you know, the Steelers didn't look that great today against Cleveland. But, you know, something tells me Roethlisberger goes into the Dome. Uh, it was snowy in Cleveland today and, you know, lights up a bad Colts defense. And, and Andrew Luck probably takes about four or five sacks. But the Steelers win a shootout. Yeah, I just don't see anybody who can guard Antonio Brown. And that's that's my biggest issue. And, of course, Le'Veon Bell out of the backfield. So, I gotta go Steelers on this one. All right, so that brings us to Sunday afternoon games. Um, the Tennessee Titans at five and six host the, go to Chicago to play the two and eight Bears. Um, I know that it wasn't a great day for the Titans as they uh, took another loss to the Colts. Almost came back though; they made it interesting there for a bit. Um, but I think they're gonna be pissed off. I think they're gonna go want to make something happen, and I think that they're gonna beat the Bears and be six and six. Yeah, right there with you, Tim, and, and, you know, Jay Cutler had another Jay Cutler performance today in the loss to the Giants. Uh, Mariota, something about this Colts monkey, the Titans can't get off their back, but, you know, they play better against other teams, and now they got an eight-loss Bears club coming in, and you know, they're going to roll over them. Yeah, I mean, uh, Bears... I, it almost kind of looked like the Bears were going to do something against the Giants, and then it just stopped. So uh, I, I still like the Tennessee Titans. I still think they got fighting them. Um, but yeah, I, I'm going. Uh, I, I'm I'm going the Titans on this one. 
The Buffalo Bills, the Bengals opponents today, will host the 2-8 and eight Jacksonville Jaguars. Buffalo Bills will be going to this game 5-5. Five and five. They will leave this game 6-5. and five. Yep, Bills will win this 6-5. to five. Or <laughs> not the score, they'll go 6-5. and five. Um, Blake That'd be Bortles awesome. will probably throw two. Yeah, it would. Blake Bortles will probably throw two or three more picks, and uh, Buffalo will get another win. And it really won't matter because they're in the same division as the Patriots, and they won't catch anyone from the AFC West for a wild card spot. Agreed. Yeah, I, I, the only thing I think that uh, Jacksonville has on them is the fact that, for some odd reason, Jacksonville looked actually like a football team today. Um, Buffalo Bills win. Tyrod Taylor, I think, has at least one touchdown pass, which is something we didn't see today. The Atlanta Falcons, they will be coming off their bye. They're 6-4. and four. They're at home, and we like, you know, like every other Dome team, for some reason, there's a different animal when they're and they're in the Dome. They do have the Arizona Cardinals coming in today, who are coming off, like we said, that loss to the Minnesota Vikings. Carson Palmer will throw a pick six. Julio Jones will have 100 yards. And the, Arizona, and the Atlanta Falcons will be 7-4. and four. Yeah. Going with Atlanta, too. And I think Devontae Freeman has a pretty good game in this one. Uh, the Cardinals have been awful uh, against receiving running backs, even though they got a pretty good one in themselves with David Johnson. But like we said, the Falcons, you know, we like them at home. We like Matt Ryan. He's an MVP candidate. And, you know, Julio Jones is going to run away, sadly, with the uh, NFL yardage leading – or the league lead in receiving yards after Green went down today. But uh, the uh, Falcons roll in this one. I think this is the only time I, I actually wish a Steeler would beat somebody. Because um, I wish Antonio Brown was up there to, to take, take that away from Julio Jones. Um. Anyway, uh, lies. Yeah, Car- Carson. Carson. <laughs> Carson Palmer throws another pick six to basically, uh, well, uh, cement his uh, name in history of being the most pick six ever, according to uh, Tim and uh, Falcons roll. That's just a guess, but I mean, that, that, that's an educated guess at the same point. That is an educated guess, and I'm you. You may be right. <laughs> So two, four, and six teams here, the Rams and the Saints. Jared Goff doesn't throw a touchdown in his debut today, but he will throw one or two this week in New Orleans. But Drew Brees is going to go crazy. He's going to throw for 2275. That's not really crazy for Drew Brees. But he's going to have two or three touchdowns in this one. Michael Thomas has been outstanding to, as, you know, for him in the receiving court, and obviously Brandon Cooks. I like the Saints at home to be five and six. Yep, Saints have too many weapons all across the board. Uh Rams still trying to figure out their running game with Todd Gurley, even though he broke out a touchdown today against Miami. Um, but I'm going to go with the Saints. Too many weapons around. Rams broke my heart today. I thought they actually were going to pull one out when they were up 10-0. Uh, Saints win. The, again, <laughs> folks, why do we even pick this game? The 6-4 and four Miami Dolphins... Weird to think that because they look terrible when they played the Bengals. Playing the 1-9 San Francisco 49ers. The Miami Dolphins will keep their wild card hopes alive. Wow. Miami's really going to be 7-4 and four this time next week. Yep. That is hard oh. to believe because they looked as bad as you can look against the Bengals. And people were saying they were the worst team in the NFL at that point. That is insane. Uh, good for them. A big comeback win today in California against the Rams. Uh, Tannehill finally got it going late. And, yeah, they're going to roll over the 49ers. Uh, even though the, the Niners were actually competitive for a while with the Patriots today. It was shocking. Yeah. Uh, Brady pulled away. But, uh, yeah, Dolphins roll. Double-digit victory. They go to 7-4. and four. Dolphins win, although Tannehill looked absolutely abysmal within the first three quarters. But uh, Dolphins find a way to win. The... We don't know what this team's going to do this week yet because they play on Monday Night Football in Mexico tomorrow. But the Houston Texans, who currently stand 6-3, and three, host the 4-6 and six San Diego Superchargers. How the hell the, state, the Houston Texans continue to get primetime games baffles me because they're not that good, even though I know their record. But i like to see Will Fuller make some plays in this game. Uh, DeAndre Hopkins can get back on a roll. So, shockingly, I'm going to say that as much as I have picked against them this year, I've been wrong. I'm going to pick them this time and see what happens. I will have the Houston Texans be 7-3 and three after this week's game. Yeah. Uh, well, they'll – so they'll be 7-4. and four. You think that you think they'll lose to Oakland tomorrow, though, don't yeah. you? Yeah. Yeah, they'll be 7-4. Yeah. and four. Yeah. I, I think they'll be 7-4 and four as well. Um, 
yeah, just something about playing at home. They look better, and, and you know, the Chargers, as close as they are to being a very good team, they just can't find the right plays at the right time. And Phillip Rivers threw four interceptions in the fourth quarter in their last loss. That's insane. And, uh, you know, he makes mistakes down the stretch, and I think the Texans hold on in a close one. Well, if I'm not mistaken, Texans are perfect at home so far this season, so I've got to go Texans. The 7-2-1 and one Seattle Seahawks will be going to play the Tampa Bay Buccaneers now without rookie running back sensation C.J. Procise. I'm, I'm kidding. He's not a rookie sensation, but he's a good football player. Um, but I like the Seahawks to keep rolling. I think they'll be 8-2-1 and two and one, as much as I like what the Buccaneers have done this year on offense with, guys, with Jameis and Mike Evans and crew and um, every running back that's under the sun just about. But, yeah, I, I, like, I like the Seahawks to go to Tampa this week, and I like them to win. See, I'm gonna I'm gonna take the Buccaneers. I think they're the hot team. They got a huge win today against Kansas City. Yeah, so, something no one no one saw coming. <laughs> they're five and five right now, one game back from Atlanta in the NFC South. And you know the the Seahawks, they went across the country. They laid an egg in New Orleans and lost. Now they go across the country and do the same against uh, the Buccaneers in the Sunshine State. Yeah, I'm, I'm going Buccaneers as well. I was impressed by what they did against Kansas City, and I, I think, uh, I don't know, something about the Seahawks on the road it just doesn't spell inspiring to me. So we go to the other team playing in Mexico tomorrow on Monday Night Football, but this time next week uh, we'll be talking about them playing the Carolina Panthers. The Oakland Raiders, a team that everyone is loving, myself included. We're talking about those young California teams, like I said on the show last week. Uh, the Raiders are going to go and make things happen like they have been doing. They can't, you know, I mean, the Carolina can't stop ACDC, not to mention going with Crabtree there. Uh, I like the Raiders to win this one, though I think Camp's going to have... Sorry, had a problem. Oh, I'm so throat. tired. <laughs> no, I had like a, I had a burp that got stuck in my throat. Yeah, that's uh-huh. great. Yeah, I like Cam to go. Still have about, you know, really good, day, really good yardage day. Um, running and, and passing, have a couple touchdowns, but it's not gonna be enough. Yeah, I want to see a shootout in this one. I think it's an entertaining game, but you know, I like the ACDC combo and the Raiders. You know, everything clicking right now, and you know, barring any major injuries, I think they're a team that's gonna win the AFC West. Uh, with a big game looming against Denver coming up. But uh, I like the Raiders in this one against Carolina. Uh, I don't think you can stop believing in the Raiders. Uh, the Raiders are a great team, although Cam laid an egg this week uh, in fantasy for me. So, uh, do you have A.J. Better... Green on your team? I do not have A.J. Green on my team. Yeah. But don't worry, i got to play DeAndre Hopkins, on, uh, who's on the other side against me this week. Uh, so Cam laying an egg sucked. So uh, hopefully Cam gets a nice little shootout, but I do think Oakland will pull this one out. So I expect this game to be a little closer than you know the records show because for some reason it always is. Um, the eight and two New England Patriots with the goat go into New York in the Meadowlands to play the Jets. Uh, I do think the Patriots will win, but for some reason the Jets always get up for this game, regardless you know whether it's Bryce Petty, Brandon Marshall. Brandon Marsh could play quarterback in this game for all we know uh, with how things are going down there. Tim Tebow, maybe. I don't know. Now the Arizona Fall League baseball is done. But the Pats will be 9-2, and two, but I don't think it's going to be a blowout. But I do think they win. I don't know. Do we count two touchdowns as a blowout? I don't really call that a blowout. Well, that depends. Is it like two touchdowns like, you know, the Cowboys beating the Bengals? Because that game was a blowout. That was a blowout, yes. But so, it was two touchdowns. In that but, case, or is it like the Bengals... The Bengals beating the Browns, because that wasn't a blowout. No, that was a Hail Mary. Right. <laughs> I already um, miss him. Yeah, I'll go ahead and say that it's going to be... I'll say that they'll probably out, outdo the Jets in yardage by about 175. So, take that as you will. Yeah, I, I can't see Bill Belichick losing to someone like Bryce Petty making his second start. And, you know, I, I don't think the, the Jets... Only scored six points on a on a hook and ladder touchdown against the Rams, and I think the Patriots have a great defensive day, and they just blow out the Jets like thirty-one to six. Only problem is this game's in New York, and for some odd reason, Patriots on the road against division teams. It's been quite interesting. Is it in uh, New York? Yeah, it is in New. York. Yeah. Oh, New Jersey. Yeah. yeah. Oh, New. Sorry, New Jersey. <laughs> East Rutherford, New Jersey. Um, whatever. 
If they're called the New York Jets, somebody needs to change the names to New Jersey. Maybe maybe they'll be uh, less embarrassing because they'll be associated with that state. Uh, but uh, I do think Patriots are going to win. I think it's probably going to be a 10-point game, though. So next week's Sunday Night Football game, we have a division matchup between the Broncos and the Chiefs. With how good the Raiders are, this game is super important. Even with the Chiefs coming off the loss today to the Buccaneers, like Shelby mentioned earlier. Um, but... I, I like the Chiefs as overall as a team better than I like the Broncos, strictly because I think that I trust Alex Smith more than I trust Trevor Simeon. And I understand this game's in Denver where they're super good, but I, I'd like the Chiefs to really make a statement here. The game is in Denver? Yeah. Okay, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take the Broncos uh, just because it's at home. If it was in Kansas City, I would you, I would say the Arrowhead crowd plays a big part in it. But Denver playing primetime at home, always good. Uh, defense looking good, and it's going to hold uh, Trevor Sim or going to hold Alex Smith. Probably force a few turnovers, uh, try to bottle up Spencer Ware because they have had trouble defending the run. Uh, and you know, I, I think it's going to be a very close game that'll probably come down to special teams and a, a costly turnover from one side of the ball. I hope Von Miller has a pick six because that would just make my night. I'm going Denver and mile high. And the last game we have is the struggling Green Bay Packers, who, as we're recording this, are down 7 to nothing at the end of the first quarter of the Washington Redskins. I'll uh, be going to Philly to take on Carson Wentz and the Eagles, who also took a loss, took a, took an L today uh, at, at, the, at, the, at the link. But I tell you what, man, there's just something weird going on in Green Bay, and I don't know what it is. So I think that Carson Wentz and crew is going to be is going to get going to get that W next week. I think the Eagles will win, too. And, yeah, it's that report about Aaron Rodgers not talking to his family for the last two years. Now everyone's looking at this guy like he was one of my favorites, and now I, I can't believe what I just read. And, and you know, and there there's, there is something. With Mike McCarthy on the hot seat, the Packers just don't look themselves. It'll be interesting to see what they do to respond to this Redskins game. And, you know, if they lose this game by double digits, it's, it's going to be mayhem at Lambeau. Um, but I, I think I think the Eagles get a big win from Carson Wentz next week, and then get ready to play the Bengals. Duh. Oh, and yeah, by the way, you missed the other miserable people in picking. But um, the uh, the Eagles win next week. I think they win fairly convincingly, especially at Lincoln Financial. And guys, I think we can go ahead and wrap with the picks there. We can go ahead and say that this is going to close out this week's edition of Men in Stripes. Uh, thank you guys for coming together so we can make an early episode um, so we can go ahead and celebrate Thanksgiving because I know Shelby's heading home to spend time with his family, so that's yep. awesome. Yep. Um, on behalf of all of our listeners, while well, you check in every week on YouTube or our Twitter link or whatever you do, have a great Thanksgiving. Uh, hopefully we'll be talking about a Bengals win at some point in the near future. I don't count on this week, like I said, but those two guys do, so hopefully they're right and I'm wrong. I'll gladly be cool with that. And um, who day, I guess. Who day? Browns win their first game. Who day? <laughs> <laughs>